Well, first, hey. Hey from the crazy United States to you and crazy Russia. Hello. I'd say maybe if you put us on the, uh, attached us to the crazy meter, the US is even crazier than Russia right now. But maybe we can get into that a little later. I, I, I first want to explain what I'm wearing. This is a hockey jersey. Uh, it, it actually used to have a big lightning bolt, very dramatic right across here. But um, I've had this jersey since the 1970s. I used to play for a team called the Colorado Lightning when I lived in Denver. And that was like a full contact checking league, really serious stuff. My body would be black and blue by the time the season was over. And um, now I just play in this uh, pond hockey. It's not a league, it's just a group of mostly old guys who play up in the Hudson Highlands where I used to live. And uh, I live in Hoboken now, but I still try to drive up there in the winter for games. And um, I played three games so far this year. We're playing with masks on. So I'm sucking air all the time anyway, at my age, playing with a mask on makes it especially difficult. Um, but you know, that's just something we have to do because we're all you know, f sweat is flying all over the place and spit. Uh, so I'm hoping to, as soon as we're done, I'm hoping to uh, hop in my car and drive up north for about an hour and a half and, uh, and, uh, and playing in a game way back in the woods of the Hudson Highlands, uh, a pond that I've never played on before. And one of the reasons I put my shirt on early is to provide myself with a little extra incentive to go. <laughs> Otherwise, I might get lazy at the last minute and say, nah, I just, I think I'll just stay here and watch Netflix or something. <laughs> this is impressive. I, I applaud you. You're, I Googled your age today and Wikipedia told me you're 68. Is that correct? No, that's wrong. I'm only 67. 67. I'll be 68 in, um, in June. Unless I'm, you know, so senile and old that uh, I can't remember my own age, but I'm pretty sure. So is, is, the, is the hockey thing uh, like not traumatic that the, the danger of, of breaking something is not a problem? Oh, no, it's pretty, it's, it can be dangerous. We don't check. We don't deliberately mm -hmm. slam into each other the way I used to when I, you know, I played competitive hockey when I was growing up and you try to annihilate your opponent, you know? like really hit them as hard as you can. That's a big part of the game. Uh, this is, uh, we're playing with very light pads, uh, pretty much just headgear and, uh, and shin pads to protect your, your legs because you know people are whacking each other with sticks, but no checking. You can't go up to somebody like this and mm -hmm. make them fall backwards. But that happens sometimes. People are whizzing around the ice and there are accidental collisions all the time. Plus, we're play, playing on ponds. There are potholes. There are sometimes rocks sticking out from the ice. There are crevices in the ice. So people fall. Um, I don't fall very often, very often, but when I do fall, it can be, you know, I'll get it like a giant uh, black and blue, blue bruise on my ass for a while. Um, and I could show my girlfriend and, you know, try to get her to be impressed with how tough I am. Um, but, uh, but it's mostly sort of accidental injury you have to worry about. One guy, though, was I w was playing with a few years ago, um, he was just skating backwards and he hit a crevice in the ice and flipped over backwards and he banged his head so hard that he permanently lost his sense of smell and taste. So he actually had brain damage. I lost my sense of smell for a while uh, because of this COVID situation. Oh shit, that's right. I, I You've gotten that since the last time we spoke. Has yeah. it come back or? It has, it's, it's hard to say whether it's uh, in full, whether I'm fully back or not, but it has, uh, it's, a, it's a confusing disease. My mother got it too recently She's just like over uh, the hump of it. Uh, she, I think like 
couple of weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago, she said that she felt like she's, uh, like she still has health problems, but she's had them anyway. Um, and uh, and she felt that the COVID thing specifically kind of lifted because the sense of um, fatigue that was like very hard to do anything about that um, uh, evaporated uh, a week and a half ago. Though, uh, in my experience and, and based on what I've read and like other people's experiences, uh, there's this wave thing. Like you feel like you're over it and then it turns out not. I mean, I got it early, so I was very confused. I didn't th think it was COVID. Yeah. Because uh, this was like early February and then a few months afterwards. And I just kept being confused about whether I'm sick uh, if I'm sick, then what the sickness is, whether it's allergies or this or that. And uh, my mom said something um, when she was still like in the um, kind of rougher period of it. She said, it's weird because I can't tell if I'm, if I feel really bad or if I'm pretending that I feel really bad. And, and that's, uh, th that sensation was uh, a part of my experience too. Yeah. But, here in here in Russia, people are not so like you said. You're playing hockey, wearing masks. I don't think you're gonna see that in Russia. People are much more cavalier about it. Yeah. Um, well, you know the numbers yesterday. So I don't know when this will air, but uh, we're talking on what January eighth. Yesterday, January seventh. Uh, the number of people who died of COVID was. Um, over 4,000 for the first time in the United States. A day? Pardon? Yeah. Over 4,000 people um, have died. So we're on this, you know, things are spiking. And then also there's the, uh, the extra infectious mutant variant of COVID-19 um, that it's, has, is spreading in the U.S. now. So most of the people I know are really pretty scared, you know, except for the hardcore, I don't know, Trump nuts or, you know, those folks um, who are beyond rational, uh, any kind of rational attitude. Um, so, I mean, even in New York now, it, it's uh, the traffic has been suppressed, both foot traffic and cars, but it's really, um, it's really suppressed now. New York, it looks like, uh, it doesn't look like New York. There are, hard, there are very few people in the streets. I think everybody is, is just cowering in their, um, in their apartments now. But and that's another reason why I want to go play hockey is right. just to kind of like, I don't know, work off some of my, uh, my excess energy that I get from being pent up. Yeah, I, for me, one of the effects of of the thing was it acted as a catalyst for me to leave in the city. I now live outside in this like wooden house with a, a what do you call it, wood burning stove. Uh, and I think I would want to do that anyway, but with the city becoming less of a comfortable place to be because of the disease and uh, and some of the things that used to be available in the city are not available anymore. It just makes less sense. And now that I've been here uh, for a little more than a month, whenever I do go uh, to St. Petersburg, uh, it's a weird feeling. Like I'm, I'm getting alienated from the idea of a city, I feel like. Like, and especially like the outskirts of any Russian city, I suppose. But St. Petersburg also always have this, has this gray sky, which when you're in nature, seems in sync with everything else. And you have the uh, nice white snow and the trees and everything. And it's not a, not a depressing sight. But when you get into the outskirts of St. Petersburg with these old buildings, gray, the snow is turned into dirt, the sky is gray and it feels grayer than outside and you just go through this thing and then you see the newer regions that um, are dystopian in, in their own way they're like 
they've started building these like entire blocks of huge apartment buildings that look the same. And so they're like colorful, they use color and it's supposed to be like happy, but it's scary for somebody who hasn't lived in that environment. It seems like a, a scene from some sci-fi movie uh, that's not supposed to make you feel good. <laughs> and uh, and it's weird. Now I go through the city and I look at it with these eyes of, this is a, a strange phenomenon that, that humans started to get get into these crowded spaces for some kind of purpose there's a sense that this is not to live well this is not a sense that this is not to increase your level of happiness there is business to be done or something uh but uh i don't know it just feels like a weird way to live now and the the, the longer i stay here the longer the more time i spend here the weirder uh the city looks like yeah, it's, um, I spent a lot of time living in New York and I still basically live in New York. I'm right across the river, but my girlfriend lives there and I was at her place this morning. I'm, I'm there all the time. I lived in New York steadily in the 1980s for, uh, like for 10 years. And then, um, my girlfriend, uh, who then became my wife, she just wanted to get out. I think there was like a really bad mugging or something. She wanted to get the hell out. I didn't want to go, but it's, then we moved to the country, to this place where I'm going later today to play hockey. It's really beautiful part of upstate New York, the Hudson Highlands. And within like a week, I, I guess I was unhabituated to New York City. And I look back at, at my life in the city and New York City in the 1980s was pretty rough. And I thought, what the hell? Uh, I, I, I realized that you kind of brainwash yourself into thinking you're at the center of the universe. And you are in some ways. I mean, New York City is a fantastic place to be a young person or to any age. You know, there's so much going on, so many interesting people and things to do. But it is, let me just put it this way. When I, I, I realized you were, you had moved out to this little place in the country with your girlfriend, uh, that sounded really great. So I'm really happy for you. And, um, and I envy you. I mean, I still like it where I am. But I am dreaming about moving to a little place in the country at some point, getting away from all the horrors of, of human civilization. I'm trying to figure out like one of the, uh, I think of it as a project. Um, but like a, an ongoing um, attempt at, at, at solving a problem, at figuring something out, is to figure out the way to live that would work for me in terms of this, like where and how, because Moscow and St. Petersburg are big cities that make sense in terms of infrastructure you get access to stuff. They're very expensive in terms of like trying to get an apartment and to get an apartment that I would consider uh, like a good place to live uh, is probably impossible for me. Um, then you have on the other side of the spectrum, you have these villages in, like uh, my girlfriend has a place in a Pskov region that's further south, uh, the weather is nicer. Uh, Pskov is itself a city that's like ancient and you know people live there and, and it's nice I walked around there uh, and it on some level at, at, at one layer I'm still like trying to figure it out and, and just learn about the situation itself like Pskov seems like a pretty nice city that it's not big it's way 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 cheaper than Moscow and St. Petersburg and if you go to uh a rural area like the place that uh, she has that's I can go and buy a bunch of these places now uh, huh. like a, an old house that's kind of fallen apart maybe but a reasonable amount of land the problem is it's in a dying village like it's a village that used to have people now it has fewer people there's no school there's no kindergarten the hospital is in the city uh, it's probably not a very good hospital. Uh, you know, all of infrastructural questions come to 
to uh, four. And now the place where I am now, we're renting. This is like a house that I guess the people who own the plot of land used to use as a summer house uh, some time ago. Then they built a bigger, better house on the same plot of land. They still go there like we see them on the weekend sometimes. Um, and this place, I guess their son lived here with his wife for a couple of years and the wife did not like it. And they eventually moved to the city and uh, they started to rent it out. It's, you know, I, I, I'm really happy we're here. Most of the neighbors are like, I, I don't know how wealthy the people that are renting this place to us are. Uh, it could be that they got this place, you know, when it was cheaper and, and uh, I don't know. But the people around us must be pretty damn wealthy because the houses are huge. And uh. the fences uh, around their plots of land are like two, three meters high. So it, if it wasn't for the fences, this would be a nice place that would, you know, the problem would be too expensive to try to buy something here. But... Then there's this like psychological social thing where these people who have money are so um, you 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 could try to figure out why that is, but but uh, the first thing they do is they build a, a big fence, and so if you walk around this place, which could have been a very nice looking uh, you know like a not even a village like a I don't know what it would be. Um, suburbs. It would be similar to the American suburbs. Um, it's not. It's you just have a wall on your right and a wall on your left. And uh, behind those fences, those walls, you see the expensive houses of people who I suspect know that these houses are not earned and could be taken away. And so you need to protect yourself. <laughs> Because the history of the country does know uh, periods like that when, when property rights were called into question by people who thought that this property should not belong to you. Does that mean that they have they probably have uh, firearms inside as well or maybe vicious dogs? Uh, there are dogs. I don't know how vicious they are, but they do bark a lot from, from behind the fence. Um, uh, the firearms, probably not because Russia is not the same as America in, in that question. You can have firearms, not to the same extent, not as easily, I think, as in America. Mm -hmm. Um, but people are just not obsessed with them. There's right. security on the, um, entrance to the place and there are cameras. You see the cameras on those on those fences. And so this is like completely, uh, it's, it's the entire, the opposite thing from what you get in a little village, like the one that I spent, uh, some of this summer in that, uh, uh, region further from the center, uh, very cheap and no infrastructure there. Uh, there's a neighbor who allowed us to use his, kind of insisted on us using his sauna when he's not there. And uh, it, the door is just left open. And, uh, you know, that was very nice of him. He kept inviting us to drink with him. And uh, by the time I showed up there, by, by the time I visited for the first time, my girlfriend used to go there for, I don't know, five years, some long period of time. And when I heard her responding to his invitation, with, you know what, maybe not today, but some other time, um, I thought that actually meant that. Turns out five years, she's saying this one line to him. He comes <laughs> over with a bottle of vodka and says, you know, come over, we have friends uh, over, let's have some shots. And she says, not today, but maybe later. For <laughs> five years, that's been going on. But, you know, people are open, friendlier. Uh, they want to drink with you. Uh, that in itself can be a different kind of problem, but here it's very isolated and these high fences and not everybody says hi, even if you say hi to them. So it's like, so far I'd say maybe a third of people to whom I say hello when I meet them on, um, you know, walking through the place with my dog, a third of them reply with, with, uh, uh like a reserved kind of hello. 
and others just walk past you as if you're not there. That's probably similar to to uh, the states. Um, you know, people are friendly. Some people are friendly, and some people are unfriendly. Um, it was wow. not my well, experience. I remember being confused about strangers in this. Like I lived in Houston for a while, which is you know different from this place where there's not a lot of people around. So here you, you would be more likely to say hello because it's a, a smaller community. But people in Houston in in the city would say hello or nod or if you're like just on a bus stop and there's somebody at that bus stop, they would say hello. Yeah. Well, those people down south where all the Trump voters, I think they're they're just basically nicer than all the progressive liberals, all us, you know, woke types who talk peace and love, but we're actually assholes. <laughs> Could be. I don't know. I, you tell me about how your culture is, your country works. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I can't say, I, you know, my country is like... I'm, I need time to process it uh, after some of the shit that's happened. I'm just waiting, hoping for a nice, calm administration this spring, one that will help us get over this, uh, this fucking pandemic. Hey, before we go any further, I want to uh, plug some product for both of us. This is a book that... Uh, it's disappearing parts of it. Let me see. Yeah. There we go. That's the, well, anyway, that's the top. And I'll just hold it up. Um, this is my new book, Pay Attention, which is uh, hard to categorize. Uh, and it is illustrated by you. That's, that's a drawing of me um, that you did for the cover. And then on the inside, and these are all images of real things. So um, the book is a memoir. And um, it's basically a stream of consciousness account of a day in my life. Even though I fictionalize it, I give myself a different name. I call myself Eamon Tool. And this is a, an illustration that starts chapter one. This is a thing that's hanging right around the corner from me on a wall, a tin uh, sculpture of a, you can see what it is, two skeletons merrily dancing. And you have fantastic artwork all through the book that I think gives it a, a kind of trippy feel. This is an angel that stands in front of a church right down the street from the apartment where I used to live, where I was living when uh, I took notes for this book. And it has this kind of sexy mystical feel that I always uh, appreciated and you really captured it. But that's that's also a real thing. You can go to Cold Spring, New York and, and uh, find it in front of this church. Um, so, uh, the book just came out like a couple of weeks ago and I'm flogging it as much as I can. And, um, people are sort of going, well, what is it? What, you know, is it like, like your other books? Is it a work of journalism? And I, I'm not sure I, it's hard for me to describe it. So I, I'm just trying to get people to go and read it and then tell me what they think it is. But as I said, kind of a stream of consciousness account of, what a science writer thinks of uh, over the course of a typical day. It's a really good book. I, I was actually kind of a little skeptical when you told me the premise, stream <laughs> of consciousness thing, a, a day in life of a science writer. And I thought it is a day in life of a science writer. It's so captivating, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I loved it. I like this idea, not just in this book. I just, whenever I encounter it, I, I'm happy when a big, important, lofty thing, or uh, maybe not lofty, but uh, something that you're supposed to care about, uh, political or philosophical or whatever, is contextualized uh, in the actual experience of life. And you, it turns out that these ideas about whether consciousness or matter is the primary thing and uh, uh, the other thing, secondary, what kind of relationship is between them, is right there next to, I think the book starts with a question, who farted? Right. Like, that is actually how it works. 
the the big philosophical opinions and decisions and and ideas are right next to just the mundane uh, or absurd or gross parts of life, and I I love that. I I think I shared with you. Uh, I had an experience uh, of the same kind of thing in the political realm where I went to, I think, three different events in the course of a week. Uh, one was this thing called monstration. This is a weird uh, tradition that started about 15 years ago in Russia. This is a something that looks like a political rally that's done on the 1st of May, which mm -hmm. was this huge thing for the Soviet state and ideology of Labor Day, uh, you know, workers of the world unite. And then the, the holiday carried over, so everybody gets a day off, but the ideology is not there anymore, so it's unclear why this is a big holiday. And uh, these rallies still take place, like the communists and, uh, and not just communists, like political forces do um, a thing, but it's not also kind of weird and not clear why. And so Somebody came up with this idea of doing something that looks like a political rally, but uh, all the slogans are puns or absurdities or something that you can't put a finger on, like what that means or why it's there. And some of these are political jokes, but most of them are just the some kind of like um, appreciation of the absurd. Uh, it's a great idea. <laughs> I, I loved it. I loved it. And and people chant things that don't make any sense. Uh, the, the the one that I did, uh, I only participated one time because uh, in Moscow, they uh, where I used to live, um, they are not held commonly because it's harder to get a permit. But uh, the one I participated in in St. Petersburg was they couldn't get a separate permit to have this thing. Uh, but the city administration allowed to make it a part of everybody else's demonstration, which made it even better because you had these like Stalinists who are not making any jokes, who are actually holding up a portrait of Stalin and marching down the street. And then after them, there are anarchists. And after them, there is somebody else, nationalists. And then you have these people who nobody even understands what it is that they're doing. And so it made things even more absurd and you could see the faces of the cops watching the thing and they could place the communists in one bucket and the anarchists in another bucket and then they see this thing and they kind of like is this you know some kind of thing that does mention Putin on uh, on on the poster should we grab that person is that <laughs> a violation of of whatever that we're defending here we're not and so that was fun um and people would chant either absurdities or, uh, uh, you know, this this procedure, this um, crowd goes down the street and somebody waves from a window of a nearby building and uh, people start chanting, that dude in the building, that dude in the building. Uh, <laughs> and so the man actually hears a whole crowd of people just chanting, you know, his presence. Um <laughs> The, the the funny thing there was uh, one of the funny uh, moments was when, so there's like a route this thing was supposed to take. And then at some point it went in some other direction uh, that people expected. And so this, this monstration crowd started chanting, where are we going? Where are we going? And it seemed <laughs> like such a beautiful metaphor for both like this whole March, not just of, of, you know, this subset of it, but the Stalinists and the anarchists and everybody else. And then the country itself, um, just marching somewhere confused about the, the purpose of it. But my point was, uh, sorry, I'm taking a long time to do this. I went to this thing and I went to an actual political rally organized by Navalny against uh, Putin's inauguration for his new term at the time. And the mm -hmm. sense that I got, and then there was also um, a, a show, a, a concert by this young uh, singer who, uh, young woman, who, she just graduated, uh, you know, high school at the time. I think she was like 18 or something. And I saw the crowd at that uh, thing. And she is 
not making any kind of political pose. She's not uh, trying to be heroic and standing up to Putin, but politics is present in songs as references, as something to make a joke about or a, a rhyme about or something. And so my sense was that the people at the political rally, at the overtly political rally, seemed like people who really want to be free, but they live under this oppressive regime. And so they really want to get Putin out so that they can be free at some point in the future. While the people at the absurdist rally and these young kids at the show where they, as jokes in those songs, there were like, you could frame it as uh, inciting violence against the police, uh, and things like that. But it's there in between first love, getting drunk as a teenager, you know, whatever uh, an 18 year old girl has on her mind. And then Putin and uh, the war in Crimea and uh, the police state are there. And so the people at the absurdist rally and the people at that show seemed like people who are already free despite Putin being there and despite there being a police state, etc. They're not held back in terms of their individual freedom. They're not scared to just be honest, just, just do what they want to be. Uh, as opposed to first we're going to fight Putin and then afterwards we're going to be able to do what we want to do. So you know, your book has that quality to me. It's not in the political realm, but in the like this philosophical, scientific uh, area of thought. But there is that, you know, the big important thing is contextualized in the actual lived experience. And the actual lived experience to me is more important than uh, what we you know, the, these systems of thoughts that we construct. Um, a couple of reactions. First, thank you. I, I think you, uh, you uh, maybe more than anybody, get what um, I was after, and I'm sure it helps that we've had these conversations over the years. I've always been struck by uh, the disconnect between ideas in my head in the way that I think about them and the way that they're all entangled with all this stuff, other stuff that's going on in my head. Like if I'm writing an essay about free will, uh, there's my argument for free will on the page. And that doesn't even have that much to do with what's actually going on in my head mm -hmm. when I'm thinking about free will, when I'm having all these doubts and then I'm thinking about my girlfriend or thinking about my kids or, um, and you know, I'm having all these emotions that are swirling around. So the older I get, the more it seems to me that when ideas are kind of lifted out of their human context and presented um, in papers and books, they are phony somehow. They're not, they're not real when they're pulled out of their context. And I'm not sure how, you know, I this is actually a theme in my previous book, Mind Body Problems, where I was trying to say that, that everybody's philosophy of life, attitude toward the mind body problem or to everybody's responses to the question of what it means to be human um, is a product of that individual's life experience. Right. And, and you can't, so the idea of ideas that apply to all people equally is absurd. But just going back to what you said about this absurdist group. I, I guess you can't call it a, a political group in the same way you can't call anarchists a political group. They're sort of an anti-political group. It reminds me of the Yippies, hmm. which were this movement started back in the 60s. Uh, two of the ringleaders were uh, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, these kind of freaky guys with long hair. And, uh, you know, the, the Yippies took a lot of LSD. So it was a very psychedelic movement and its reaction to um, what was going on to the Vietnam War and uh, to racism and, and sexism. Actually, they weren't so good on sexism. The, hippie, the hippies were, were kind of backward when it came to treating women as, as uh, equals. But you know, they were sort of a radical progressive group in some ways, but basically they were trying to mock the whole idea of politics 
and to show how absurd it was, how absurd the, the greed and the lust for power that you see in American society is. Um, and uh, the problem with a, with a group like that is that, you know, if you're expecting it to lead to some kind of, I don't know, agenda for change, that doesn't really happen. It's, it's more of a, a, uh, a personal style but um, you know, they did sort of get involved in, some of those people got involved in the uh, protests at the 1968 Democratic Convention. Uh, I recently watched a movie, a new Sorkin's movie about that. Uh, the, yeah, so that you saw Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin were characters. Right, right. And, then, and, and I think he tried to portray this tension, this clash between somebody trying to be an actual political organizer Tom Hayden was, mm -hmm. and then these these guys who are not into not into the the political work, I suppose. W what is your perception of them? Like, like is that kind of approach uh, that's further removed from uh, you know trying to pe get people to vote for something or enacting some kind of actual policy? Uh, do you see them as helpful? I, I really liked them when I was young because I was kind of an anarchist acid head who didn't give a shit about anything. Now that I'm a bourgeois professor with two children and a 401k, um, I, I see that as kind of, I still think it's, it's funny. I'm sort of glad that there are groups like the one you were describing in Russia. I think that kind of mocking, ironic attitude toward all human ambition is uh, is really healthy. But at the same time, I take politics seriously, and um, you know now more than ever because of what's happened to the U.S. over the last four years under the Trump regime. And I, you know, I want to, I want to see. I care who gets elected. I don't think it's all bullshit. I don't think it's all a waste of time. I believe in a progressive liberal program gradually making halting progress and um and you know so i want to see decent politicians uh elected so i'm no i'm not really i'm not really attracted that much to like total anarchism and absurdism in the way that i used to be basically when i had nothing to lose mm -hmm. when i was angry how about you i am trying to I, I, I'm not sure if I uh, finished the thought I started earlier. One of the projects that uh, I'm thinking about is this like, try to figure out for myself how to, like what kind of lifestyle in terms of owning property, house, uh, engagement with the place where I'm at, um, and how it all factors into the country and so forth. Like I'm trying to figure that out and the way the way that uh, thought process works is there's, on the one hand, I'm thinking about my own individual life. I'm trying to make decisions that would work for me, for my girlfriend, my future family, uh, maybe my circle of friends, or rather, you know, for me as a part of this network of friends, etc. But in the background of my mind is um, the fact that I don't think there is right now in Russia a reasonable kind of ready-made choice for uh, for living. Um, you know, it's not like you're when you're 18, you're thinking, okay, so here's one direction, another direction, another direction, it'll make sense. Uh, I just need to pick one that works best for me. I don't think we've figured that part out because like the previous way was the Soviet way it was imposed on people and you just accepted it. And then that system collapsed. And what we have now is, um, some kind of thing in, in infancy, in, in the process. People haven't uh, answered these questions for themselves, what makes sense, what doesn't. And so part of my thought process is if I figure out this thing for myself while also thinking about this as a some kind of a template, then this could be... Uh, a hugely important thing for for the culture, for the country, for for other people who could 
uh, use, you know, look at what I'm doing and do something similar, uh, their version of that. So I'm in the early stages of that process. There's another process um, that's more convoluted, vague. I, I don't know what words to use, um, but that's that relates to the psychopolitica, the newsletter that I'm doing, and it's uh, it's my word that I, I'm trying to catch all the things that I think are important or beautiful or uh, necessary or meaningful with, and um, there the unanswered question that I'm struggling with is the I'm trying to find a way to look at political realities and political action uh, and at the direct experience of my life, which includes drug trips and dreams and uh, intuitions and ideas, as well as relationships and, uh, you know, sensations in the body and whether I'm sleepy or not and, and all that kind of stuff. I want to have a coherent way of approaching both of those things that would have the appreciation of the absurd in it as well, but would be productive, both on the individual level and on the kind of bigger social, uh, maybe political level. I think you're pulling it off. I, it's, it's, um, you know, it, se it seems experimental in the best possible sense. I, I can sort of see you trying different things and and putting different things together and getting these odd juxtapositions of the psychedelic, the political, historical, dream visions, all of that. And it's, I, I feel like you're, you're really onto something. You know, this, this reminds me of the 60s again. Um, I, one of the things, by the way, I, I should mention as far as the Yippies go, uh -huh. one sobering fact about um, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin is that Abby Hoffman ended up committing suicide. So he, you know, he was this kind of manic, uh, sort of willfully jolly, merry figure who actually ended up being profoundly depressed. Jerry Rubin sold out essentially and became a figure on Wall Street, I think, you know, just decided to go for big bucks. Uh, but a lot of people in the 60s, what they did was instead of like, you know, fighting capitalism and America's corrupt form of democracy, they decided to form their own little communities mm -hmm. and, or carve out a little space for themselves uh, where they could find happiness on their own terms. And um, again, what you're doing now, go into your place in the country and, uh, and, and then doing this experimental art, um, it reminds me of this aspect of the 60s that I think was one of its, one of its uh, sort of noble, more noble features. Uh, I just happened to be reading now, um, my girlfriend suddenly started trying to convince me to read Patti Smith. Mm. So I'm I, I just finished reading her book, uh, Just Kids. So Patti Smith, of course, is the poet, artist, rocker. She's like a real classic, hardcore 60s sort of rebel artist figure. And um, and I just, reading Just Kids just gives me all these flashbacks <clears throat> of what it was like being in the 60s and being an aspiring hippie. And this as well, and it's sort of, you know, she's not really deliberately political, but in being non-political and, and seeing your own life as a work of art, as a work of poetry, that's kind of a political act in itself. And um, I sort of feel like that's what you're trying to do. I, I feel like you're, you're doing a kind of a Patti Smith type thing in the best possible sense. See, I don't know much about um her uh you know i've i, I, I know a, a fair number of songs I, I have respect for her i've seen you know some of the archival footage i'm not, not a huge 
fan, so I'm not as versed in her life. I've heard an argument, I guess, against um, what she did, the thing that you're describing. I think it's in the hypernormalization, uh, the movie. It's a documentary by Adam Curtis, who's, do you know about him? No. He's great. Uh, his his uh, documentaries are some of the most thought provoking. Uh, he like builds these narratives uh, through which to look at the political and historical events uh, of like the 20th century and the 21st now. And mm -hmm. they're, they're his, you know, you, you understand that this is a lens. It's a way to look at things um, that's not like the objective reality but they're uh, very interesting and worthwhile to look through. And um, one of the things that he said about Patti Smith, I, he used her as an example of somebody who retrieved from direct political engagement into yeah. self-expression. And I think he criticized that he sees it as one of the reasons um, there was not as much political advancement, uh, you know, progress as there could have been because people retrieved from this social engagement with their community, with their country, uh, and so forth into just uh, expressing themselves and, and being a creative individual. Uh, I don't know if that's a fair critique or not, but... I think it probably is. I, I mean, she she's... You could, sort of, you could call her sort of self-indulgent in the extremes that mm -hmm. she got toward being a, a poet. And she identifies very much with the, the kind of uh, um, like Rambeau or Baudelaire, or William Blake, sort of artists who were at the edge of madness mm -hmm. and who were very much into their own dreams and their own inner landscape. And uh, to the extent where they are kind of retreating from the world, but um, I don't know. I find her, I, I, I find her an attractive figure. I actually, I, I'm not a huge fan of her music, either, except for her song Gloria, which I love. It's a fantastic right. song. Every, right. I think the first line is, Jesus, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. I get, you know, goosebumps every time I hear that line, and um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, there was always this tension in in 60s counterculture between living for yourself and saying fuck you to society and trying to be engaged with it and trying to make things better for other people as well well so my project the way i can see of it now and uh, it's not like i've made great progress but uh, the um, challenge that i present myself with is to unite those opposites. I want this to be about weird dreams that I have as well as political action and actual changes to the, the physical reality of how the country is living. Um, and then I also have these like other obstacles to be mindful of such as recently they've made this uh, they've um, signed this new law. It already has been the case for, I don't know, a couple of years maybe, that any um, media venture that gets any kind of, or political uh, you know, organization, uh, gets any kind of support from abroad, monetary or otherwise, uh, they need to self-register as a foreign agent. And uh, any mention of such organization in the media should be preceded with, or in the brackets you go, you know, this is a foreign agent. Here's what they're up to. Here's what they say. Um, and, and now, this would apply to you? now they've extended this to um, any individual who receives any kind of support from the West. In my case, I make money working with Americans. Right. Um, and... Uh, so individual who receives any kind of support from not the West, from abroad and engage, does any kind of political, social work. Uh, so that, that person must label themselves as a foreign agent, uh, go uh, you know, to uh, the appropriate 
uh, authorities and register as such. And uh, and I think if you are in the eyes of the law a foreign agent, but you didn't label yourself that way, then at first you get a fine. If it goes further than that, there's actual jail sentences now for this. Jesus. So uh, that's something to factor in. And the way I'm answering that question for myself for now is I'm not doing any political work in Russia. <laughs> I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm not looking to organize a party. I'm not. I'm not going to be uh, the actual straightforward political activist. Um, but I do want to be engaged in the life of my country and and make it better. And so this is just like one of these pieces to somehow put together. Um, but it, it works for me for now in terms of like me trying to envision what it is that I'm trying to do because I do want it to be not simply political work. I want to invent a new genre for not just expressing yourself but for enacting change. And, um, you know, one example, I have I have two examples right now of things that I haven't done, of things that I'm interested in thinking about and I'm trying to think about and I don't know how um, out there they're going to sound to you so one is we've talked about you know if really if I come up with a way for people of my social class to live right if I invent the Russian uh, reinvent the Russian village or invent the Russian suburbs that are going to be healthier and more productive than uh, or better in some ways than the way I perceive the American suburbs or if there's something to do with the city or uh, individual living you know nowadays with the internet getting more spread out still a problem still an argument against getting a house somewhere far away like that village that I spent some of my summer this year in no reception uh, even phone doesn't really work but maybe you can find a place. Maybe there's, anyway, if I figure a way for myself that would work for others like me and it becomes a thing that, let's say, a thousand people do, um, then this is not political work in terms of, you know, I didn't organize a party. I just solved my own uh, problems, questions, my, you know, the, the question of how you live your life. But if I did that in a particular way that could be applicable to others, it suddenly becomes a development within the culture. And uh, you can imagine if you uh, extrapolate it to just, you know, endless degree, you can imagine a new emergent political class or economic class or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how personal can become political um, if you do it in a certain way. That's one thing that I'm thinking about. The other is weirder. Uh, I've recently, I mean, I've known about this, but haven't thought about it properly, I suppose. I realized that the Amanita mus muscaria mushroom, that famous red cap, white dots, uh, mushroom that is actually in uh, it's the logo of the psychopolitical thing I'm doing. Yeah, um, it is both legal in Russia and um, a part of the culture. You see it if you look at the illustrations for children fairy tales. You'll see those mushrooms on playgrounds. Uh, the sandbox is often. Uh, you know, have the actual sandbox and then you have something like a roof from the sun and that roof structure is the image of the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Sure. Um, the the drawing that I'm using, uh, the symbol that I'm using for the logo of the newsletter, I stole it from the, uh, what do you call it, table for checking eyesight. So if you're uh, a grown-up, uh, the way they check your eyesight is they show you this... Um, poster with letters of the alphabet from 
big size to small size, and you read those. If you're a child who doesn't know letters yet, you're shown the same thing, but instead of letters, there are images. The first line, the first huge two signs of that poster is a star and the Amanita muscari mushroom. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so it's, it, and there is, you know, there are, and, and Russia is a mushroom loving country, not in terms of psychoactive mushrooms, but generally there are countries where, cultures where people don't go to the forest and pick mushrooms. Russians love that shit. And, um, and there's this meme from the early 90s that Lenin was a mushroom. I forget if I told you about this or not. Um, I, 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 I know you've told me some really crazy, uh, um, like hallucinogenic stories about Russian beliefs, but I'm not sure I remember that one. So this is in line with this. It's in the same bucket, I suppose, with that, you know, the absurdist rally. Uh, this was actually in the Soviet Union still was in the late days of the Soviet Union when, um, you know, thanks to Gorbachev, more things were shown on TV and were printed as books and so forth. There was more freedom. And there was this avant-garde musician, Sergei Kuryokhin, who together with his friend, journalist, uh, made this presentation on TV and they like laughed through half of it. And it was obviously half of it was made up on the spot and it was a parody. I think what they were going for is at the time you started to see these uh, like documentaries that would make some outlandish claims about history, sort of like the equivalent of uh, History Channel's Ancient Aliens, right? That kind of thing, but in the Soviet milieu, uh, such and such poet was not, he didn't hung himself, he was killed by the KGB or something. And so they took it to an extreme and came up with this, um, they presented as a theory. Kuryokhin, who's a musician, uh, presented himself as some kind of researcher. And the claim that he tried to defend is that Lenin was, Lenin and other prominent revolutionaries were doing large doses of psychedelic mushrooms for an extended period of time. And according to, I think he referenced research from MIT, um, if you do that long enough, then the personality of the mushroom replaces the personality of the human host. So in effect, the person becomes a mushroom and then uh, some other research recently um, have proved, has proved that mushrooms are somehow waves. I guess that's like a nod to the weirdness of quantum physics. It's both a mushroom and a wave. And so Lenin was both a mushroom and a, va a wave. And it was this like, just, you know, that was absurdity, that was a parody uh, shown on TV, but the story goes that um, since the TV was such a, you know, controlled medium for all, all of its history up until then, uh, this was where you got the official party line uh, that many people did get very confused. And uh, <laughs> there were, there's apparently like the Leningrad, um, there were some Leningrad communists, like members of the Communist Party who filed uh, like an official note to their leader saying we need to to get to the like you need to give us a definitive answer was lenin a mushroom or not <laughs> and uh apparently she said a mammal cannot be a mammal cannot be a plant therefore lenin was not a mushroom which of course doesn't make a lot of sense because mushrooms are neither uh <laughs> mammals nor plants so that seems like somebody trying to get away from answering the question. But anyway, point, there is like mushroom stuff within the culture and these mushrooms are psychedelic and um, they're legal. And it turns out that some people are making these like branded things. Like they put, uh, I have it in the kitchen. I would show it if I brought it with me. Uh, they you know, collect the mushrooms, dry them out, um, 
grind them and turn them into these capsules and sell those as like a dietary supplement uh, that solves all problems and might also have a mild psychological effect. So this is microdosing. Um, huh. so I thought, because you and I think you and I have talked about them, maybe, maybe not uh, online like this, but I think we've talked about them previously. I thought it's like, first of all, it's like a extremely powerful uh, hallucinogen and, um, and it can be dangerous. I mean, it, it's toxic, right? I think that's correct. It can be dangerous. Um, you can I die think, if you take too much. I think so. I, well, that's what I've heard anyway, um, uh, or get really sick. Um, there are different have kinds you, of them. And, have, you uh, tried, have you tried microdosing it yourself? I mean, what's it, what's it like? So I've been since, since this discovery that this thing is out there. Um, I started taking them daily. These are small doses. This is like, uh, a third of a gram or something. Yeah. Uh, though the one I'm doing is supposed to be, there's Amanita muscaria and then Amanita pantherea, I think, or pantherina, I forget the, the, but it's referring to the panther because the skin is brown, the, the cap is brown instead of red. That's supposed to be a stronger, more potent, uh, and maybe more dangerous. Or oh, it's, people, I'm, I'm or, pretty sure that one is, is yeah, that one is really dangerous and and people mistake it for some other kind of right mushroom and eat it and die now and then so that's the one i'm doing <laughs> are you, so are you doing are you high right now on on this shit i'm not it's not so it's a it's a very small dose so the effects are not uh it's hard to put your finger on them uh you know yeah. whether it's placebo or not uh the effects that I would report if asked is uh, you seem to be in a better mood. There seems to be more of a focus or mm -hmm. uh, something similar to the flow state. Like whatever you're doing, you're just doing what you're doing and that's enough. You're not distracted by thinking about things you could be doing instead. Um, it, there is a little more energy. Um, I've noticed on particular days that speaking is easier. You just say words and, uh, and and they go faster than they normally do. Um, but it's all, you know, these are small doses and the effects are not so pronounced for me to be um, confident about that. It's, it's really interesting. Um, so uh, I actually have to go soon. I got to eat lunch and then go play hockey. <laughs> but um, I, I just wanted to end by saying uh, this this whole issue of what the responsibility of an intellectual or an artist is, um, you know, political responsibility, social responsibility, uh, is, is really interesting to me. And it's something that I struggle with a lot. Uh, you know, I'm constantly making choices because I write on a regular basis for Scientific American. It's a wonderful platform for me. I can reach a lot of, I do reach a lot of people. And, uh, you know, especially over the last year, so much stuff has happened. I mean, it's all, there are always things to write about. So I, you know, I feel like a responsibility to write about uh, violence and war, things like that. And, um, you know, so over the summer, I wrote an article on defunding the, the Pentagon. But uh, the posts that I enjoy most are the ones that have basically nothing to do with reality, you know, with political reality, with the pandemic, with uh, politics, um, in part because I'm so sick of Donald Trump, I don't want to think about him. I sort of feel like, you know, he craves our attention and I don't want to give him my attention. And so um, as a result, I've immersed myself in really esoteric science and philosophy, quantum mechanics mainly, you know, so I've been spending the last eight months um, devoting a lot of time and energy to trying to understand quantum mechanics. And, um, and the irony is that, you know, the people who think a lot about quantum mechanics think that that is reality, right? It's the basis of reality. But what I'm struggling with uh, 
is whether it's even the basis of scientific reality. The more I go into quantum mechanics, the more I, it becomes like smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, this isn't a novel insight, but I'm, you know, I thought maybe once I learned some of the mathematics and some of the technical jargon that I'd see the logic of it and its connection to the real world again, whatever the fuck that is. But, um, but the more I go into it, the more distant it seems from anything that really matters to humans, uh, except in the most kind of abstract philosophical way. And that makes me happy. You know, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, there's part of my brain that loves just thinking about that kind of stuff about quantum entanglement and the possibility of parallel universes. And so I, in a way I kind of have a disdain for it, but I love it at the same time. There, there's a term I wanted to throw at you, but I don't know if you've heard it, inner immigration. Oh yeah. Tell me, tell me um, what that is. You mentioned it in. Uh, how how in, much more time do you have? Do you have five minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, yeah. Like maybe maybe five minutes, 10 minutes at the absolute uh, most, okay. but I do want to hear about this idea. Okay, so I'll, I'll throw in the inner immigration and try to finish the mushroom thing that I was uh, trying to get at. Uh, the inner immigration, uh, I've known this as a term that was used in the Soviet Union, in the late Soviet Union, and I guess in the 90s in Russia. Uh, since then, I've discovered that it has a longer history with Germany and France, specifically with Germany, with the, you know, the Nazi part of the, its history. And that's the, in the Soviet system, uh, Soviet culture was a way to describe what some people did uh, in the period of late Soviet Union, which is disengagement from the political reality of their country. And you just get into, let's say, quantum physics or uh, Eastern mysticism or whatever. You make your life completely parallel in not intersecting with the political social realities of your country. And the context that I got from Wikipedia uh, of the German situation, it was a debate about the role of an intellectual or just a, you know, a person living through that kind of period, you know, you're under a, a horrible regime. Some people emigrated, left the country and felt okay about that. At least you're not a part of the system. Some people chose to stay. And the argument was about like who has more guilt, who's, who, who should feel more guilty because, you know, you left the country, you fucked off. That's actual emigration. You're not solving the situation. Somebody has to stay on the ground and try to do something uh, about the system. So I guess the context is different than the Soviet, the way it was used in the Soviet system and the, in the Nazi part. But I just wanted to throw it at you because your quantum experiment seems to be not far from that. You have all the stuff going on with Trump and, and rallies and uh, the pandemic even, and you're in immersing yourself in a different thing. Yeah, you know, I I have a column that was just posted uh, yesterday morning. Uh, the title is, is, Schro is the Schrodinger equation true? The Schrodinger equation being the, the sort of iconic formula uh, describing quantum behavior. And, um, and it almost instantly became the most popular mm. uh, piece on the Scientific American website. And I think it's because a lot of other people also just want right. a change from, you know, the shit show right. of American culture and politics right now. And they want to think about something completely uh, esoteric and, right. uh, and useless and abstract. Let me try to, within a minute, uh, finish the mushroom thing. Oh, okay, uh, sure. I, I was just using it as an, another example of an opportunity as I see it. There is the psychoactive thing that uh, grows in the forest that's not going to land you in jail because that is not a part of the criminalized list of uh, drugs that's present in the culture with all this rich imagery and uh, different meaning attached to it and jokes and stories and whatnot. And if I find the right way to use that thing for myself and it'll be a template for... Uh, how to use the substance 
generally and it's embedded within the already existing cultural landscape, then that kind of thing can again be a more significant change to the culture, to the society than, um, you know, an oppositional rally uh, or, or an attempt to get some policy through that's not going to get through because there is so much resistance to it. So that's Listen, another... There are, there are infinite varieties of human happiness and meaning. And, um, and I think ultimately everything is political in the sense that we're all connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you're finding ways for other, you're finding ways for yourself to be happy and to, you know, extract a little meaning out of the chaos uh, of existence. And you can tell other people about that and it can work for them too. That is definitely a political act. Uh, and um, so power to you, man. I, I mean, I, you know, I just hope you. I'm not going to make this available in Russian so that there's no, uh, assertment that what I'm trying to do is a political act because that gets me in trouble. Oh, okay. All right. I take it all back. No, just, <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with politics, but <laughs> what the hell, just, just keep doing what you're doing because it's really, I love reading your, uh, each new, uh, post of psychopolitica. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, uh, you know, you're, you're really carving out a, a completely original, um, realm for yourself, for your, for your, you know, creative imagination. And uh, it's really cool. So I can't see, I can't wait to see what else you do with it. Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, we should, as, as a closing thing, say that we agreed to do this conversation every other Friday, right? Yeah. So we're going to continue this conversation. And uh, I have more weird ideas to try to throw at you and try to articulate. I, I look forward to it. All right. Uh, good luck at the hockey game. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nikita. I appreciate it. Thank you, too.